amazing. Okay, um, so I'm gonna, um, I don't even know where to start. Uh, maybe let's start with um, this slide. <laughs> so um, this slide is of an application called I Am Afraid. And it's a VR app um, made for the daydream. And it's uh, voice activated. Um, so basically, uh, you can say a word. It appears in the space. It has your voice in it. Uh, the paper ball things have other sounds in them, like laughter or grunts or whatever it is that you'd like to put in the environment. And then you can play with those sounds. It's called I Am Afraid um, because, uh, well, first it was born out of love of words, number one. Um, but also, I was asked to do a TED Talk um, last March, and I was asked in November, and there was so much fear. Uh, this is November 2016, and you might remember some of what was going on back then. Um, and I was just like, wow, like, this is crazy. Like, the stories we're telling ourselves, all the words that are spinning around, and we can't really, like, we can't get a grasp on what's happening and how to shift things. Um, so I started to think about my own fear uh, and how I had been, have been investigating fear for about the last 18 years or so um, because um, I used to have anxiety attacks. And so this was kind of like, huh, okay, so I know a lot about fear, and so how can I design an application that can sort of look at it directly, um, but still in a playful way? And so that was that application. Um, because one of the things that happens when you're scared is you start to talk to yourself. <laughs> and you just repeat things over and over again. You don't even realize you're repeating that. The, the, the same words, and you, you can't quite see the stories. And so this was a way to put it out there and start playing. Um, and this is um, a short, I'm not gonna play all of it, but this is a video of some of the sounds that you can make using the words that you put in the environment. This environment was an environment that I created for the TED Talk, so it's got a bunch of fear words um, and phrases. Uh oh. Sorry about that. I have to somehow change the audio source, right? How do I do that? Yes, I want to just speak to my Mac. <laughs> Here we go. So Panasonic TV or internal speakers? Uh, yeah? Panasonic. All yeah, right. That's the one. Okay. So then I go back to here, play from current, current slide. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. 
So this is um, this is somebody using it in Montreal, and they were actually musicians. So that was, um, so they basically created this library of paper balls and words and they were mixing them and so these are people that had a lot of experience um, beatboxing as well as with Baroque music so you, you heard all kinds of sounds in there. Um, so it can be used for many different things and it can be networked, right? So you can have many different people in the experience and playing with each other's voices. So. Um, so that was great. Uh, I'm also um, a clown, and so part of um, the talk, the TEDx talks, I, I was thinking, okay, so I've created this app. I want to use it for the TEDx. How do I do that? Um, so I decided to kind of um, do a blended performance where I would perform fear physically as I'm going onto the stage and then hide in the headset uh, so they, they could see my internal state of fear with the words in the space and play that for a little while and then emerge out and connect with the audience um, with, well, hopefully no fear, but <laughs> turns out TEDx is pretty fear inducing. So, um, so that, that was, um, so that was that. So that's me in the headset uh, on the stage. Um, and it was interesting and I think it started me thinking more about performance and VR and clowning and dance, uh, which I had been doing for a little while anyway, but um, I started doing a bit more of it. So that's, um, that's in New York and then that time I decided to take words from the audience. And so I went out in the audience and got the voices of the people and got, and Here's the thing though, this app uses IBM Watson, um, so it's pretty good at detecting English uh, sentences and words in context. When you just say one word or one or two words, it, it can get very messed up. <laughs> so, so as a clown, this is great, right? Like it means that I can just improvise and that's sort of the comedic quality of the whole thing is you don't know what Watson's gonna come back with. Uh, so it's a collaboration between me, Watson, and, and the, the audience. And then at the end uh, of the talk, I, I just kind of remix the words. Um, so that's another close up. Um, of, and, and this is the thing, connecting with the audience in that case was you know me taking the headset on and off constantly. Not ideal, if I had to do it again, I would rehearse and do blind groping for words. Um, uh, <laughs> which I think would be even funnier. Um, and then uh, this is just last January, um, just a few weeks ago actually, I was in New York for a dance in VR uh, workshop slash residency. Uh, the dancers that we were supposed to work with uh, got stuck in Puerto Rico. Um, so at first we said, okay, well, we're, we're dancers, let's just do the dance ourselves and film, our, film ourselves and we'll just do a kind of a, the workshop that way. But the more we were filming ourselves, the more we were like, okay, this is just way too funny. Um, so let's just go with the clowning and VR theme instead of dance. And so this is, uh, this is us uh, experimenting with clowning in the uh, Samsung uh, roller coaster uh, ride. Um, and then we also had the, the HoloLens and so we did lots of um, experimentation with, with that. And we only had one HoloLens and so that also became a device so that we could, you know, I mean as dancers we're pretty good at space so we could remember where the, where the things were. And then, so then, but then once in a while we put something new in the space, and so then it becomes an interaction between the person not wearing a headset and the person wearing the headset, and how do you exchange headsets? 
Uh, so those are the kinds of things we were exploring. Uh, and this, this is older work, uh, work we did with theater and, and uh, virtual environments. Um, and using the theme of puppetry, so manipulation. Um, so you have objects that are being tracked, uh, bodies and objects that are being tracked in space, manipulating a virtual world. Um, going from uh, a concentration on the virtual world, so less emphasis on the actors, puppeteers, to kind of a middle ground where you're paying attention to both uh, the clowns and the, and the virtual world they're creating, this paper world, and to this kind of crazy juggling act where, you know, if you just looked at the juggling, you'd have a great show. Um, even even so, I mean, the connection between what they were doing and the virtual world was quite uh, amazing. It was uh, basically they, they were mimicking cleaning up, as kids, cleaning up their room and imagining this whole entire world based on visiting spaceships and, and uh, underwater worlds and things like that. So a very good match there between the physical and virtual. Um, and this is, uh, again, earlier work with dance. Um, and, and virtual worlds, uh, again, using this idea of tracking bodies and objects, the, the screens are being tracked as well as the dancers. Um, oops, sorry. And uh, those um, py pyramid shapes there are actually also being tracked and are containing other worlds. There was two other sites in that particular dance piece. One was in Montreal and one was uh, just downstairs from where we were. Um, and those, when the dancers were carrying these pyramids, they were containing the other worlds. Um, so, just going very quickly here, and then I'm going to wax poetic about some of the things I've been thinking about. So, this is something completely different, not VR. Um, and those are chickpeas with obviously some, uh, some color added to them, uh, post-processing, not actual color uh, on the chickpeas. Um, so this is a work that I'm doing with Alex Haas, uh, where we programmed a 2D scanner uh, without, they, we, took, we removed the top off the 2D scanner, and we put organic, living and dying things on the scanner, and we programmed the scanner to go and scan a little area and go back and wait a little while and scan another little area, it's all random. And the scanner is left uh, out um, in the f in view of a window, so there's sunshine uh, that comes in sometimes. So it's um, influenced by that. Scanners are not meant to be used this way, um, <laughs> but uh, it turns out this scanner is amazing. So this scan, like when we set up a scan, it goes on for five six days, um, and the scanner is constantly going. Uh, with little breaks, obviously, in between the little scans, but it's it's an amazing, and we've been doing this for a very long time, and the scanner is old, and it's still going, so yay, <laughs> Epson. Um, the, this particular scan is sprouting chickpeas, um, and on top of the chickpeas, to create a good environment for them to grow, uh, even though they're being subjected to the light of the scanner, um, we put uh, dirt, moss, leaves, you know, just like a, a chunk of earth on top of them. Um, so that's, uh, oh, and I should say, so once we've collected all these tiny little scans, uh, there's, at the end of five, six days, we've got maybe 50,000 scans. Uh, and uh, I wrote a program in Touch Designer to kind of reconstitute the scans to show this kind of like uh, shifting time and space. So in any one frame of this, this animation, you, you see many different timelines. So this is uh, this, um, a shot, a medley of some of the, the things that we've, we've done. There's no, there's no sound yet. There will be sound soon, but. So definitely slower pace stuff than, <laughs> than the, uh, most of what we're used to in VR.
you're seeing that with the waves of light and dark is, is the sunshine and nighttime coming in and out. This was done last August. Yes, yeah, that, and that's how we are human, as human beings, and we're constantly shifting in and out of our stories, and I, that's what we were trying to explore, was like, how do we get at this sense of time that is so fluid? Yeah, there's always lots of experimentation. Yeah. So some of the chickpeas grew. Um, some of them immediately got taken over by other life. Um, <laughs> and then some of them started growing and died. Um, so, and, th and this was probably in a way the, the most successful work in the sense that we really wanted, we didn't want to just capture things drying up or dying. We wanted to capture this kind of like things always transforming. Um, so that was, uh, and so, and, and you know, we're always playing around with how, <coughs> how do we not shock people <laughs> immediately with, you know, mold and, <laughs> and, so, you know, starting with the pink and kind of, you know, going in and out of different rendering styles is, is a way to play around with that. Um, so, yeah, I, um, I'll keep this going. There's another, um, I think there's another experiment after that. I think there's the m m Japanese maple after this one. Yeah, so that's the... That's the last one, and we, the, um, you know, every time we cap, we we gather materials from around where we live, um, and when we process, usually there's a week lag, obviously between the scan and uh, when we actually process the data, and when we process the data, we spend a couple hours together, talking about whatever, right? Because it takes time to experiment and set it up, and and. Uh, Whatever's been happening that week, whether it's in the news or in the lab or you know in the city, it infuses what happens. And this this California was burning that week, and and we just that somehow seeped in there. We were talking a lot about smoke, um, and you know the beautiful sunsets that that you get when, <laughs> when the smoke comes, and yet thinking about wow, like think of all the suffering that's happening at the same time. So so that that was that. Um, I've been, you know, in technology for a very, very long time. Um, and comparatively, I suppose. Um, and I'm not often shocked um, by things, but I have to say that I was shocked uh, a few days ago, I was, you know, completing some really boring admin task, you know, with the lab or admin or whatever. And uh, a friend of mine was sitting there and he said, did you know that they launched a car into space today? And I just was like, what? <laughs> 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 and, and it just, it all of a sudden came crumbling down on me, the insanity of, of what's going on. Um, and how these decisions are being made and we celebrate uh, progress in a way that is completely um, devoid of context. Um, so people that I immensely respect were celebrating this launch. And, and I was like, how can this be? How can we be doing this? And you know, in the next breath, he tells me about the Pentagon is gonna have a a parade for, for Trump, and I was just like, okay, <laughs> I just need to 
take a breath here and figure out what this lab is doing. Now the lab is called base, the Basically Good Media Lab, and um, a lot of people uh, laugh at the, at the name, and it's partially why um, I chose it, is, is I wanted to trigger a question about what goodness is. Um, so, and how, how we can be basically good in the world. And basically is like, okay, everything is happening all at once. There is no mistake in, in a very sort of global sense. But how can we look around, get more and more context so that we're making decisions that are a little bit more thought out, that are a little bit more about the greater good, um, and it also keeps us on our toes, right? Because, you know, how, how do we behave with each other in the lab? How do we conduct research? Uh, what is valuable to do? All of these questions come to the foreground. So, um, you know, I, I love the presentations that I've seen here today because they are addressing that question of being good. Um, so, yeah. I'm going to end it there. I'm going to say that, oh, maybe I'll just do, I don't know, the, the actual um, snippet of, of what I was going to, what we were going to present today uh, was about virtuality um, and addressing this issue of what is the virtual and how that, that term actually has been used in philosophy for, for quite a long time. And being virtual uh, has a lot more to do uh, with infinite possibilities, right? It has to do with dis disrupting the solid stories that we have. So it's not that um, the virtual is digital. It's not that we need to put on a headset to be virtual all of a sudden. Uh, we're constantly virtual if we're uh, reinventing the stories and if we're, <coughs> if we're conscious of the, the, the fluidity in our minds and in the world, we are being virtual. The moment we focus in on, okay, well, this is the story and this is how I'm going to act in the world, we've become less virtual. We've become actual, right? Um, so so this, this idea of the virtual is interesting to me um, in a headset because it creates an in-between state. And to me, it, that in-between state is only useful to the extent that we're sharing it with others um, so that we can both be physical in our bodies, communicating about a shared virtual state, right? And it is an in-between state where you're you're taking the virtual virtual, uh, you know, that's the non-actualized space, making it an in-between actual space and talking about it. Uh, and it's and it's more fluid than you know this, um, but a little bit less fluid than you know what's happening in the hyper-object world. So I'm not gonna use too many words. I think you probably all know what I'm talking about, but that's uh, that's kind of where we're coming from. <laughs>